Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I also pay my special respect to all the fallen heroes from Spring Revolution in Myanmar. At last, not the least, to all our panel and participants from different parts of the world to join AMI seminar today. Our AMI president, Christopher Lam, will open the meeting. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, such a good group of people here tonight is really good to see. It's a very important topic and to have so many people with a good, strong interest in the subject matter and how we're going to be able to help meet the healthcare needs of the people of Myanmar in future is a really important thing to do. We have a program tonight with quite a number of speakers. The moderator for tonight will be Paul Komisarov, our board member, but also the executive director of Global Reconciliation the prominent NGO. And I hope that when this work is done by us tonight and by the speakers later, we will have a very strong proposal which AMI can support as it goes forward to DFAT for funding. I'll have more to say about that at the end. So now, Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. And welcome everyone to today's seminar. Over the last year, the world has watched in horror as the Myanmar army, after its attempted coup in February last year, has carried out brutal massacres, torture, rape, and arbitrary arrest of the democratically elected government and civilian population. Independent reports show that more than 1,500 people have been murdered, including many children. More than 11,000 have been arrested or disappeared. Nearly half a million have been displaced from their homes. The democratic institutions, which were being painstakingly constructed after more than half a century of dictatorship, have been obliterated. The economy has been ruined. As bad as all this sounds, it's only a small part of the story. With a bloodthirsty intent, probably unparalleled in modern times, the junta has systematically targeted the health care system, which, although always under-resourced, was sophisticated and well-trained with a committed public health apparatus. Dozens of doctors and other health care workers have been killed and hundreds arrested, especially those who have stood by the civilian population and cared for those injured in clashes with the army. For this audience, I don't need to recount the awful facts in full detail. Essential medicines and support systems are, are either in desperately short supply or are lacking altogether. ICUs have been closed. Vaccine programs have been halted. Endemic diseases are in many areas now going largely untreated. Programs for psychological support are virtually non-existent. Conditions are especially dire for the internally displaced populations, which have extremely limited access to all basic services, including healthcare. In the face of this carnage, the people of Myanmar themselves have responded heroically with characteristic courage and determination. Against the force of the oppression, they have gathered what resources are available to provide the necessary care to those in need. Doctors, nurses, paramedics, and ordinary citizens have established new structures where old ones have been destroyed. The ethnic health organizations, long the mainstay of healthcare in many parts of the country, have taken on an even greater burden. Today's seminar is conducted against this background with the aim of exploring ways in which those outside the country, in Australia and elsewhere, can help provide humanitarian assistance to those in such dire need. Our task is a complex one because it involves systematically collecting the data about needs 
and then finding ways to ensure that whatever aid is provided actually reaches the people for whom it's intended. This, it will obviously be necessary for close cooperation to be maintained with community-based organisations across the country. As a preliminary part of this process, we've invited a range of speakers and commentators to give some short talks, about five minutes in length, which will then be followed by some commentaries and general discussion. Anyone who wishes to ask a question is requested to place it in the chat. Our first speaker is Dr. Daniel Ye Yint, a practicing psychiatrist in the private and public sectors in Western Australia. Daniel's a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists and a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the United Kingdom. His practice involves a holistic approach, which incorporates both pharmacological and psychosocial interventions. Since the coup in Myanmar, Daniel has been involved in pro-democracy movements and advocacy for human rights in that country. Daniel, thank you for addressing us. Thank you very much, Paul, for your kind words. And uh, hello, everyone. So, um, so in the five years leading up to the coup, the landscape of healthcare system in Myanmar was very different. Most patients are getting good quality of care, free health care from the public hospitals. During the COVID crisis, nurses and doctors worked endlessly to flatten the curve. We were ahead of the, our neighbor ASEAN countries to receive the COVID vaccination, and there's a plan to roll out the vaccination nationwide very soon. But everything changed after the coup in February 2021. Many nurses and doctors refused to work under the military regime and spearheaded the civil disobedience movement. Since then, the armed forces have systematically targeted intimidated healthcare workers. They have raided COVID-19 clinics, take away all their medical equipment, arrested doctors at their homes, hospitals, revoked license of prominent physicians, surgeons, and block vital humanitarian aid, resulting in decimation in the Myanmar healthcare system amid the pandemic. Today, Myanmar is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a health worker. To give you some examples, Dr. Tata Lin, a former director of Myanmar Public Health Department, was arrested in Yangpo June last year with her husband and her young son. Friday last week, she was sentenced to three years in prison with hard labor for alleged returning a vaccine and immunization grant from UNICEF and WHO. Similarly, Dr. Momo Nyentun, a surgeon and a lecturer at the University of Medicine Mandalay, and his wife, Dr. Sui Zin Un, were beaten and arrested by the security forces from their home under the charges of having ties with NUG. While detained in prison, he reportedly caught COVID and sadly died. He was only 45 years old. Many of such similar stories are happening around the country every single day for our healthcare workers. According to the report by the Physicians of Human Rights, this is a US-based organization, there have been a total of 415 attacks on healthcare, 286 health workers arrested and detained, 128 health facilities have been attacked, 30 health workers been killed. And military has also exacerbated the dire COVID situation that causes the devastating impacts with an unprecedented surge in deaths during uh, July, <laughs> September last year. Even after the COVID, it is documented that there are hundreds of people still dying each day because of the collapse of the health system. Early 1 million children are not receiving routine 
affects immunization, leaving vulnerable measles and other communicable diseases. According to UNICEF, nearly 5 million children are missing out on vitamin E supplements, putting them at risk of infection and blindness. The impact is worse in conflict areas, as we can understand, as the, their government hospitals are not running at all, and the people are mostly in refugee camps in the jungle. I was privileged to be at the meeting when the Prime Minister Scott Morrison met the leaders of the Burmese community in Perth on the 27th of March, 2022, this year. Ironically, it was an Armed Force Day in Myanmar. The Prime Minister has announced that in this financial year, Australia has committed to provide more than 95 million Australian dollars in assistance to the people of Myanmar and to provide targeted aid for internally <laughs> displaced people in refugee camps along Myanmar Thai and Myanmar Indian borders. This is an excellent opportunity for our groups, Australian Myanmar Institute, EMI, Global Reconciliation NGO, Australia and New Zealand doctors to compose a grant application with the Australian government. The fund of the grant will be used for humanitarian aid, especially in the much needed health sector in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Yuyin. And um, as I um, intimated in my opening talks, one of our objectives here today is to collect information and data uh, which will form the basis of a substantial grant um, application sometime in the future. Our, our next talk, our next speaker is Dr. Um, Thet Tay, who's currently working as a um, consultant psychiatrist um, in Queensland. Um, he um, also has been um, very active in the um, actively involved in the Spring Revolution movement and with Myanmar people around the world. Um, Dr. Um, Tet Tay. Uh. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, because of the time constraint, I would just go straight to the main points today for the audience. And uh, I want to start with the skill of the disaster that has unfolded relentlessly since the military coup. According to um, UNAC data, the total number of IDP is now more than 900,000. It is almost a million people stuck internally displaced within their own country. Every single day, you know, you can imagine each of them are struggling with basic needs of life, not like us. So about food, about shelter, about the cover, bed sheets, and clothes and medicines and everything, including water. And at the same time, they are facing hopelessness, helplessness, insecurity, and constant fear for their life. That's why they are running away from their own government, Burmese government, and their own army, because they are fear of life. So that's, that's you know, really, you know, stimulate me, my first question. Why almost a million people being displaced and run away? It's simply, as I said before, uh, simply a fear factor. The government is instilling the fear into the public in order not to uprise, in order against them, in order not to help the resistance. So it is about fear factor that driven large number of people. Now I want to move on and talk about a few examples of how they did that, about the terrible, you know, atrocity. Firstly, you know, uh, back in December, on 7th of December last year, there was a little village called Dongtor Village in Middle Burma, in Sakai region, where more than 200 people is running away from their home. And on that particular day, the army raided the village, rounded up people, arrested 11 villagers, and burned them alive. While they are suffering the anguish, the other villagers, they were hiding and they were hearing the screams and anguish of what happened. At the same, during the same month on Christmas Eve last year, in a different region, it's called Karenni State, in a Fruso region. And in, on that particular day, again, more than 40 people 
were rounded up and, and arrested and shot and burned alive, many of them. And that included two staff from Save the Children and also men, women, and elderly people. Now, I want to put just one more example about the atrocity. It is about what happened in Chinlan, is a northern Burma. And there's a little, very beautiful mountain top town called Tandalan. Again, the Burmese army raided the town, bombarded with heavy artilleries and burned houses shooting civilians. More than 900 houses were burned and the whole town population, 10,000 you know, Chin people, mostly a Christian Chin people, they run away. The town is a deserted you know, um, area now. So this kind of similar incidents are happening across the whole country. You know, if not every day, it will be every week, every month, many, many occasions. And this is, for all of us, this is crime against humanity. This is human right violation happening in a big scale that's causing the IDBs. And now I want to move on to the second topics very quickly. So how do we help these people? So I'm really glad that SWS said we're going to get a grant, large amount of money from Australian government to help these people. But you know, our group is a little bit anxious about that. The money should not, must not go through the government. The money need to go through the right channel to reach the right people on the ground. So with this bear in mind, we are you know, small group. We contacted National Unity Government, met with health minister last week, and, and discuss about how we can reach the people. And also, in addition, I have contacted with uh, various uh, people from ethnic health organization and from, for example, Karini State uh, Consultative Council member and also Kachin um, IRCC, ITP Refugee and Relief Committee. And I also contacted Rakhine people and Chin people and just to listen their anguish, just to listen their what actual need and how we can deliver and implement, you know, liaising with local organization. So in conclusion, you know, as we all, you know, understand massive humanitarian crisis is happening in Burma as we speak. And I want, you know, all of, all of you to help, you know, in many ways as you can, you know, to help with this disaster. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Hette. Um, and the, the comments that you made about the logistical challenges in um, actually providing support um, are, are going to be very, very important issues for us to address um, as we develop our ideas here. Now, our next um, speaker is in um, Myanmar and um, um, her name is Dr. Tharamu um, Tu Ku, um, and she's a senior consultant with the Karen Ethnic Health Organization Consortium and the Karen um, Department of Health and Welfare. And she's speaking on behalf of herself um, and Dr. Edma Murden um, Miat Kaur, who's the se um, senior executive officer of both of these organizations. Um, Dr. Um, tu Ku, I know you have a presentation. Um, are you able to share your screen or would you like um, Mikhail to do that for you? Well, now the screen is, uh, you have to activate it. Now it's disabled. Yeah, so that Mikhail, can you do that? Because um, I, I don't think that Tuku is able to share her screen. Yes, I can share it now. Okay. Okay. Okay, lovely. Well, yes, we can see that. That's perfect. Yeah. So last week when I'm talking with Paul, uh, uh, he will let me present us about the medical needs for the IDPs. So I'll present it about the medical needs of IDP. And I also have a chance to interview three to four camps coordinator for this IDP camps coordinator or IDP camps responsible for this topic. So after the military coup, the public health of the Myanmar largely collapsed and the people do not 
rely on it. As uh, I'm in the country of Myanmar, uh, now the public health system of Myanmar is, you can say that totally collapsed and some, some public hospital has to combine, like two hospital have to combine to one hospital to run, uh, fully run, so that they can run it fully. And some hospital, they have to combine three to hospital to run, to have a complete run. So after the military group, the public health system becomes like that. And now most of the people rely to private and ethnic health care systems. So uh, private, uh, they did not go to the public uh, care hospital. So they go to the private health care hospital. And most of the private hospital in Yango or other area become more crowded. And then ethnic health, uh, people rely on ethnic health care system. And then the ethnic health care clinic, they have a referral pathway and then refer to the secondary hospitals of the, uh, uh, refer the patients the, to the uh, private health care, uh, private uh, hospital. So most of the system is now become like that in Myanmar. So people have also been put at risk by increasing violence and attacks on villages and township by the military. I did not explain it, but I think you will all understand about it, even ourselves. We have to make concern for our security and safety also. So we can say that the country is now the most dangerous place in the world for a medical worker. So uh, even... Uh, us or even me, I, uh, sometimes I did. Uh, I do not travel to uh, remote places because of the security reason. So I think you will understand what I mean. And then for all the healthcare services, all the expenses have to come out of the pocket. So at first, uh, you, uh, according to the UHC or like that, out of pocket will be reduced. But now uh, you have to go to the private, uh, uh, hospitals, secondary hospitals, and now all of the expenses have to come out of the pocket. But in Yangon or in some area, we have like a low profit or no profit uh, ethnic uh, hospital. So we have some links with our uh, current people in uh, current state or current people in current state. Then they have a small referral pathway with that once and then we can provide some support as much as we can. So this is about the healthcare current near my healthcare situation. And then uh, the difficulties of the IDPs. This morning, as I already mentioned, I have talked to three to four responsible person of the IDP camps and they mentioned that currently most of the current people in the hard to reach area have to run out of their villages and most of them have to stay in the IDP camps and some in the forest. Uh, even in my hometown, in my hometown, even in my home house, there are many IDPs from uh, the current estate because they, most of them are my relatives. So nearly 25 or 26 people my relatives of 25 to 26, to 26 have to come and stay in my home. So we can mention how it's happened in our country. So IDB could not get proper health care. So we can know because uh, the current people have to uh, move away from their current state and then have to uh, move to like Shen State or Bogor region or some of the people, they have to move to the Karen border, Karen state border area. Uh, and then to the Tangu, it's like that, to some of the township that we know. And then the Karen people, they have to uh, go to, uh, they have to move to the IDP areas or some, some people, they move back to the, uh, current people, uh, some current people move to Pago area where they feel like it's safe. So it's uh, it's not safe for the people in Myanmar now. And the, and then <clears throat> and IDP people have to rely only on the ethnic healthcare workers and healthcare service. And then the ethnic health organization health staff 
for not refer patient as usual due to travel restriction. Ah. Last four or five years, they refer know, no, 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 no. patients to the yeah. uh, township, but now it's become New. like a uh, due to the travel restriction and security reason they could not refer patients. And then due to COVID-19 situation, it can become an outbreak in the camps too. This is the concern that they uh, worry for them. And then medical needs for IDP. SKDHW and KEHOC is working for IDPs. And now we have an experiences in working in uh, most of the camps, most of the IDP camps. So uh, now we are implementing a uh, mobile healthcare services and then some medical support. And also, we also have some uh, like cash distribution uh, for security reason, we could not distribute foods. So we distribute uh, 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 cash distribution. So it's okay for them. And they also mentioned that uh, the following 10 needs are also important for them. So basic healthcare needs in the camps and then temporary infrastructure for the healthcare service in the IDP areas. And then number three is emergency maternal and Thai care services and equipment because of they cannot refer uh, the patients if the uh, mother, the pregnant mother is in the uh, restricted area and they, they cannot come to the township level. So number four is emergency care for the patient, such as emergency DSW, it means gunshot wounds and operation and trauma care. So they need uh, the emergency care for the patients and also some equipment for them too. Uh, and then COVID-19 prevention and materials need to be support. And then number six is also important for them. It's like psychological support for the IDPs. And then, hello. And then number seven is nutrition support for the IDPs. Hello? Hello? We Hello, can hear you. you. Yeah, because of the light is, <laughs> light went out from my side, sorry for that. And then seven is the nutrition support for the uh, IDPs. And then uh, if possible, uh, like uh, emergency referral pathway for the IDPs need to be find out. And then uh, according to interview with one of the IDPs yeah. camps, uh, he mentioned that shelter needs for the IDP is now important because of it's near to the rainy season and wash activities uh, also need to be considered for them. And they also mentioned that implementation way for the medical needs for the IDP uh, need to implement through cross-border organization and then ethnic health organization in the country and then through the ethnic administration organization coordination. And then uh, the program must be like, need to have an integrated healthcare services program that is integrated mobile services and integrated healthcare services. So like, uh, if even we have uh, integrated mobile services, mobile healthcare services, and it will be uh, okay for some area and for some area integrated healthcare services need to be include when we consider a program. So uh, even we need to have a contingency plan for our emergency healthcare delivery. For example, uh, COVID-19 or cholera or DHF, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. We need to have a contingency plan when we are supporting the uh, medical needs for the IDPs. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Tharamu Kutu. Um, that was a very uh, useful and um, comprehensive presentation. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Cynthia Mong, who's a, um, the founder of the, um, the May Teo Clinic. It's a community-based organisation that's been providing free healthcare for IDPs and migrants um, on the Thai Myan, in the Thai Myanmar border area. Dr. Cynthia, thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to your presentation. 
Uh, yes, uh, as everybody, um, my former presenter already mentioned about the humanitarian crisis uh, in Nima and on the border area. I, I don't need to go further, just uh, like a things military coup, as everybody know, we have almost uh, 600,000 people displaced and the human rights violation escalating and amid of COVID and the health workers are also detained, oppressed, and many of them also displaced to the border area where the ethnic um, people on control area. Sorry. Uh, so even before the COVID, no, uh, in the Eastern Burma area, we already have humanitarian crisis, what we call is like chronic emergency. And the protracted displacement has been ongoing since the, the militarization and the civil war in Burma. So the Eastern Burma is home for almost half a million of people. And same time due to the neglect and oppressive uh, regime, and disinvestment in the health and social service, the ethnic health community and organization on the border building the, the health infrastructure on primary health care service, as well as train the local ethnic health workforces, and also like uh, develop the federal health policy that we ensure the accountability of the all governance level. Um, since the military coup, the impact on Health is uh, the health system has been deteriorating, and the health infrastructure, some health infrastructure in the ethnic community being destroyed, and health workers themselves displaced. And be before the military coup, there are uh, after 2015 uh, the ceasefire, uh, the ethnic health organization and the Ministry of Health have building the relationship on the like training and the referral system as well as working together on the like immunization program. But uh, since that time, many area, uh, the broken relationship between the ethnic health organization and the military control health ministry and access to life-saving advanced labor care service are in, also interrupted. And the supply chain also interrupted and this being restricted by transportation and confiscation by the state administrative council. And we used to have the cross-border uh, cross border collaboration and the referral uh, disease surveillance and training. Uh, since the COVID-19 and the military coup, there is more restriction uh, by the Thai uh, authority and Thai government. So that made uh, difficult for assessing the uh, secondary level care or advanced level care. So which can contribute to the maternal death, neonatal death, and low vaccination coverage, and widespread human uh, like uh, food security, as well as we expect to see more malnutrition and the increasing violence, insecurity, and it can cause like a psychosocial trauma among the displaced people. So to respond to the humanitarian crisis, the local ethnic health organization also trying to maintain the existing uh, essential primary health care services, including building the like COVID-19 facility and uh, isolation, testing, quarantine and treatment, and continue building the capacity of the health worker. And also building the community resilience through expanding the civil society network and ethnic health among the ethnic health organization. And also working together with uh, trying to work locally with the local Thai Happily help to improve access for the referral service as well as uh, to get some supply and uh, information. And also mobilizing the financial support and upgrading technical capacity and improve organization capacity to respond to the needs of the, the organization because of the things growing and growing needs and unmet needs. Uh, the organization, each organization itself, uh, they some of them, they can no longer exist in, in, in Myanmar site, and some of them, they have to reform their organization and making sure that the organization 
can respond to the needs. Uh, uh, yeah. And same time, uh, we need to we have to advocate to the the international NGOs and the government for opening the cross border humanitarian corridor because of the restriction and support coming through Thailand or cross border is restricted in different way. So we need to continue working together with the local Thai civil society or uh, Thai institution and some of the, the NGO for advocating for the cross-border and the ethnic health organization and the health workers uh, who fled to the border from Burma also need to build the trust with the community and promoting community participation as well as building, trying to continue building the community networks. And also the social protection is another issue. People are so desperate need of help and people who return from, um, because of some of the people who are living in Thailand uh, can no longer exist because of the legal documents or jobs, so they have to return to home or people movement is growing in this time and people who used to access HIV treatment from the Myanmar government hospital can no longer access this uh, and the women, children are documented, so different level of uh, intervention need to be, uh, need, need to work with different organizations. So today I would like to highlight for what is the role of the international community and partner to intervene or to address these issues. So all the people of Burma are united to fight against the military detectives. So thus we need to stand solidarity with the people movement and to avoid action that legitimate the state administrative council and that violate the human rights violation and the human Nigerian assistant uh, should develop to tailor the local context, different context, because in each different ethnic area or also inside Nyama, in dry zone, different humanitarian needs and different context. So we need to continue, uh, continue multi-sectoral consultation and continue consultation to meet, to meet, meet the needs of the local people and to continue support the community resilient through increasing humanitarian support and developing strategy for community involvement and long-term community ownership. And we need to also invest in the local capacity building and reinforce local system through building, building the equal partnership between the international NGO and regional and local partner. And also, we need to continue advocate to the responsible or related stakeholder, including the Thai government or international community to promote or to make uh, favorable for humanitarian assistance for more efficiency for aid delivery. And, support, and we also have to work with the human rights, uh, meet human rights group, media group, and to protect human rights. Uh, defender because since uh, the human rights violation can continue making the atrocities and crisis, so we need to stop that and to ensure accountability and transparency of humanitarian intervention by all the, the humanitarian aid should be accountable and transparency and to work together with the local community and better communication. And so for all the humanitarian assistance, we, when we work on not only working on the relief and humanitarian, we need to look at the building the capacity of the local organization and make more secure and sustainable way. And also that can make more people uh, participation and inclusive peace process. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Cynthia. Um, the, you've drawn attention to the very great complexity of dealing with the um, multiple partners, the international partners, but also the different governments in the border areas. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation. Our last speaker is um, Dr. Raymond Tentway. He's a psychiatrist from Sydney, who's known to many of you. He's contributed extensively to the care of Burmese people in Australia and to medical education in Myanmar. 
Um, Raymond's a graduate of the Rangoon Institute of Medicine One and is a senior consultant psychiatrist and psychotherapist in private practice in Sydney. He's also deputy president of the Australian Myanmar Institute. Um, Raymond, thank you. Um, now, um, Thank you, Paul. Uh, as a member of the Australian and New Zealand Medical Professional Group and a practicing psychiatrist, I appreciate the opportunity to present on the acute need for psychosocial support among the traumatized people of Myanmar. The magnitude of this man made disaster since the military coup is immense. The healthcare system has collapsed, and there are uh, approximately one million internally displaced people scattered across the country, uh, including ordinary civilians who were forced to leave their homes uh, due to the military's indiscriminate attack on people. In reaction, people have joined resistance groups to defend the people uh, from the military. Internally displaced people face malnutrition and deadly infectious diseases such as cerebral malaria. Uh, many are not able to cross the country's border and end up in no man's land in the jungle, which carry its own health issues, including injury from mine explosions. Women, children, and the elderly are particularly vulnerable. Given the magnitude of the man-made disaster, considerable uh, mental health consequences caused by grief and loss were inevitable. The loss of homes, livelihoods, and the disruption of community network have contributed to the psychological impact uh, of the coup as recovery is more difficult in the absence of support and hope. In the aftermath of the atrocities and human rights violations, the community has experienced collective trauma and a long lasting and crippling PTSD. This has been exacerbated by the continued health and nutritional deficits, social, financial, and occupational impoverishment. These issues may continue for many years without spontaneous remission. The actual event or symbolic experience of helplessness and an inability to influence the outcome underlying the trauma. In other words, the trauma sufferer feels trapped in the memory of the original terrifying event, which is like an imprint and follow the person like a shadow. These memories manifest themselves in the forms of flashbacks and nightmares, so-called reliving experience, causing a long lasting and debilitating mental issue. Psychosocial uh, support is essential to help alleviate the chronic psychological distress and mental health needs. Some groups are especially impacted, such as pregnant women who are at risk of developing perinatal depression or mood disorders. Others too may develop anxiety, depression, panic disorder, and difficulty dealing with grief. And many of them will be left with unresolved grief. There is a risk of intergenerational trauma being passed down if support is not adequately provided. Funding is required for the implementation of a train the trainer program, which aims to create a crit critical mass of trainers and counselors to support the vulnerable and deprived IDP population. These programs require funding for internet services, daily education, evaluation and research, and providing educational materials. This is based on the well-established ICRC and IFRC model, translated into Burmese and modified to suit local, cultural, linguistic, and spiritual needs, as trialed by a group of workers, including the Sydney-based Burmese Medical Association among trauma survivors in the Irrawaddy Delta in the aftermath of Cyclone Nagis in 2008. These trainers will empower members of the community to be active in recovery and rehabilitation through training and equipping individuals to help each other. These programs also offer training in psychological first aid and aim to reduce the stigma associated with mental illness. A coordinated and collaborative response, perhaps in collaboration with already existing services under the NUG MOH, Minister of Health and National Health Council on the Thai Burma border is needed among donor agencies and local partners to design effective and feasible strategies, including capacity building through training of nurses, counselors, doctors, and teachers, who will in turn train others inside Myanmar who deal with the displaced people by means of the train the trainer model. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, uh, Raymond. Um, it's a really important reminder of the importance, the critical importance of psychological support, which is often neglected in these critical emergency situations. Um, and also you've drawn attention um, to something that other people have referred to, and that's the importance of education and training in the multiple areas of support. Um, now, we're, we're now going to move to um, discussion, and I'm going to um, ask um, a couple of people if they'd like to um, make some brief comments. Um, but um, I just remind you of how we introduce this session, that we're starting a process to gather information and build partnerships with a view to um, developing a substantial grant application to the Australian government, which will obviously come after the forthcoming election. Um, so, and we're looking for people to participate in this process. So if anyone listening would like to contribute, um, please feel free to contact us. You can either contact me directly or contact the AMI through Maykiel or Chris Lamb or Raymond or anyone else. Um, um, so, as I said, we're now moving to discussion. Perhaps I could ask Ian Campbell, who's, um, um, uh, who I know has worked in this area, um, to maybe by way of com a brief comment commentary on what you've just heard, um, to reflect on the, uh, on the role of the community-based um, organisations and the processes that are rooted in community in, in responding to these crises. Thank you, Paul. Um, I've really been, um, I've held all that I've heard in deep respect, and I just want to thank everybody who's spoken. Um, I've worked globally with local neighbourhood and family-based and street-based conversational processes for the last 30 plus years, coming out of the HIV AIDS epidemic and linking that to various other issues relating to health, uh, not just Ebola and COVID, but um, addictions, um, post-conflict resolution approaches through local neighborhood conversation. Now, I heard, I listened very carefully to Dr. Cynthia and also the very fine last presentation um, where the commentary was made about the non-negotiable need for psychosocial support. Um, what I would ask is, to what extent is the potential being seen for um, neighborhood-based engagement where there's synergy between home, neighborhood, and other community clusters that might include internally displaced people in camps and border areas where people have come from Myanmar into Thailand and so on. What potential is there for, uh, and what is already happening around an implicit process of neighborhood conversation that synergizes the intimacy of family and the um, shared concern and the potential shared hope of neighborhood community in terms of making a difference through health entry points, even in very high conflict and high suppression situations. This with many colleagues I've worked with in different parts of the world, including Myanmar, uh, back as far as 1991 in Yangon and Moray, and then also from 2015 with uh, an international NGO that was looking to see a cluster approach to community health form. And then uh, just before COVID came, uh, I was working with others um, in the, in the um, northern part of Thailand and the southern part of Myanmar. And we saw the cross connection uh, through neighborhood conversation on both sides of the water, for example, that would that did bring a sense of cohesion and connectivity between families on the one side families on the other, um, local communities on either side, and um, local NGOs and um, organic groups that simply wanted to make a sense of safe landing for people who were coming across to Thailand. They were um, of mixed nationality and of mixed religious background, and they were doing a great job. Now, I'm conscious of what's happened since. And so I'm really asking the question, what's the potential there for even now stirring the, the, the potential and the capacity of local community conversation through strengths-based approaches that in different parts of the world we have called simply SALT. Get the story, respect people by listening to their story, that brings about a sense of 
presence and accompaniment and greatly stimulates the, the sense that psychosocial support is happening. It's a listening process that appreciates the strengths of local people to care, to connect, to be community, to change, to have hope and to transfer from one area to another. And then um, is the learning disposition by all players on the ground. I was interested in Dr. Cynthia's comment about strategies for community engagement. I wonder if even now in different parts of the landscape and the situation in Myanmar, there's surely must be scope for going this route from the inside out and putting money and policy and practice into that, along with all the other systems intervention that is obviously needed. There's a complementarity here in my experience that is there to be discovered. Um, so I just want to put that out there, Paul, as, as a question, um, with respect to what I've heard and with the view that there is immense local community capacity all over the country that needs to be respected, understood, observed, and explicitly uplifted by an intentional approach to the facilitation of local neighborhood and wider community conversation through a health entry point. It doesn't have to relate explicitly to politics, but this, if, if health is being damaged, then health is also the entry point for the long-term solution. Just a thought. Thank you very much, um, Ian. Now, I'm going to go back to the speakers in a moment. We, we have a number of questions. Um, I'll just mention that we're um, that we normally finish um, on the hour, but um, with Chris Lamb's permission, we might go a few minutes longer if there's um, interest in doing so. Um, I would, however, um, like to take invite another comment from someone who's who's put a comment in the chat, and that's Dr. Alfred um, from um, from uh, Karen State, who's a, a surgeon. Um, Dr. Alfred, if you're there and you would like to make a, um, a, a personal comment, um, I, we'd really be keen to hear about your experiences. Might not still be on the line. Yes, there we go. Uh, I'm Alfred, uh, around the areas and now we are now what we are now facing is uh, some financial problem to deal on or to buy the medical cost and and also we have uh, we have to care most of the traumatized patients and most of the uh, emergency obstetric cases where uh, now Dr. Alfred's become muted. Can you keep going? Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so may I request each and every group of persons to help as as much as possible if. Um, okay, okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the um, comment. It was quite hard to hear, but I think we um, understood um, the gist of what you were saying. Um, I'd like um, to um, go back to the speakers. Um, in relation to what's a, a key issue for, for us, and um, certainly um, um, uh, Dr. Um, to Ku and 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 Dr. Um, Murden, um, if you're there, and Dr. Cynthia, um, I'd like just to talk a little bit more about the actual logistics of providing uh, the kind of aid um, that we're talking about. We understand that there's a huge array of issues and problems in almost every area of health need, um, and that that there's a, a need both for the re-establishment of infrastructure, development of public health systems, uh, of training um, of people at all levels of psychological support and so on. Um, how, uh, what, what I'd, I'd like um, you to develop a little bit more though, 
is how we could actually get that aid to you. Um, 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 doc, Dr. Um, Tuku, you mentioned how the aid needs to come across the borders. Um, obviously, there may be some sensitivities and limitations on what we can say in this context, but I wonder if you can just explain a little bit about the dynamics of aid and perhaps even comment on the role and effectiveness of international aid donors at this stage. Would we be simply replicating what is already being done, um, maybe adding, adding to it quantitatively, or is there some additional mechanism that we should adopt to make sure that the people who are really in need are, um, are, are actually the beneficiaries of the aid? Perhaps I can ask Dr. Tuku or Dr. Murden, if you're there, to comment, and then I'll um, ask Dr. Cynthia um, to um, develop that further. And then I'll ask the other presenters if there's anything else they would like to say in relation to the other talks. So, Dr. Tuku, if you're there. Ama Cynthia, please, uh, you first. Ama Cynthia. Ama Dr. Cynthia, you first, and then I will follow you. No, please. Okay, Dr. Cynthia, are you happy to go first? You go first, and then I will follow now. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we um, can. For sharing our experience, one of the most important issue is whenever the emergency happen, we should have our own like a preparedness plan because sometimes uh, the border area is very unique. We have very diverse community and people are moving back and forth and the organization also changing the leadership and uh, because of the uh, there are many organizations move into Myanmar site. So the first thing is whenever the emergency happened, we have to start communicate uh, from the field to the field, field to the organization and from the regional to the central level. So the coordination mechanism need to be established and with the support from different communication mechanism, um, we, we need to maintain our connectivity uh, this is the most important thing. So the coordination for supply or coordination for like human resources, as well as uh, like a, the, the, we need to start establish uh, uh, the, the standard uh, protocol guideline, standard procedure and all the kits we need to provide for the emergency essential supply. Like uh, many women start uh, cannot access to the health facility. So, the traditionally women deliver, um, many women continue to deliver at home or if they cannot access to the services, we have to uh, to to send uh, like a delivery kits or also the community also demand more for the, like a first aid kit or basic first aid kit or like the medics also uh, asking for the advanced level like uh, for, the, the surgical kit. So we have to develop the system or standard package for like food, nutrition, or delivery kits. And also for the for the, the supply chain. Also because of the difficulties for assessing supply from inside, like especially in the Karani area or Papua area, uh, we can no longer access uh, the, the supply from inside. So all the procurement system need to be established. And we also need to start coordinate for all the warehouse along the border area. We need to work together with the existing local Thai community and local network or transportation system. Uh, because of, uh, as you already aware that the restriction from the Thai uh, military or Thai government, it is very hard to make sure that the supply can send timely. So we need to advocate and work together with some of the Thai civil society group or human rights group to advocate for cross-border assistance. And uh, our Thai partner also work with the, 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 the politicians and some universities. So series of uh, seminar and forum being conducted to deliver 
effective to deliver AIDS and effective to make sure that the effective delivery of AIDS. So the coordination is one of the important, one of the most important issue and getting support from the existing uh, local network is very uh, essential part of work, but at the same time, we need to follow all the, the standard guideline protocol. So it need to put a lot of effort to make sure that we are working together and complementing each other. Okay, thank you for that. I'm um, Dr. Um, Tuku. Yes, uh, after following uh, Ms. India, I want to mention that from in-country side, sometimes it's not easy for to distribute the uh, aid to the IDPs area, but uh, for KDHW and KHOC, we have like uh, uh, two offices in Yama sites and also in the Mesa sites. So it's a bit easier to do things. If uh, we cannot access to uh, the, we cannot access to the uh, Kapon and then other area and then they will uh, SSA grid from Thai border sites. And then for uh, the area that we have to assess from in country, we use the KDHW uh, office site. So we have two sites so that we can implement and we have to coordinate for two offices. And then it's not easy from Yama site because now due to travel restrictions and other things, now, we have uh, previously like the IDB camps, it says like if it is just two to three hours uh, to reach them, now it's become like four to five hours because we have to go uh, around to reach to them. It's not, the, it's not like previous time uh, because we have to, uh, if the travel way is straight at first, but now it's the travel is, way is not straight and due to like uh, restriction, travel restriction and also security reason for the staff, uh, we have to go around to other villages and then to the IDB camps. So it's now a little bit difficult to assess them. Then we try our best, we try our best to reach to the IDPs. And then for the materials and the kids, at first, it's easy to buy things in Myanmar, but uh, uh, based on ninth uh, from the Myanmar government, they uh, declare one letter for the import and export. So it will become a difficult piece for the NGOs and NGO to import materials for the like material, uh, medical supplies for that. So I think it will become, uh, in future uh, pro program, it will become difficulties for the aids or the supplies that we will distribute. But till now it was because uh, we are just buying things in Yango and then we send it to the IDPs. And then for the perennial state, uh, according to my experience, I will share some of the, the things that I did it for the, uh, IDP areas in the current state. I don't, I didn't even know the supplier because the supplier will call me and said, Tuku come here. Uh, he will not come to me and I will not go to him uh, to their places, but we met in one of the street and then we uh, share the things or the medical supplies that we want to distribute to the IDP's area. But uh, the IDPs, like the IDPs committee had, and me, I have a contact, but I don't know who will carry the things. And then just we met in one, uh, uh, one area or one uh, on the street, and then we provide all of our like uh, in care, uh, in kids or like the materials or the mother, the pregnant mother kids, and then we put in on there. And after one month or one and a half months, the camps uh, committee will call me and told me that, uh, will call me and tell me that to go, we receive your things. So this is the way currently we have to use in Myanmar for the uh, IDP's aid. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um the, I, I can only comment how extraordinary your accomplishments 
um, are given this the the overwhelming challenges that you face. That's um, I'm, I'm I'm very very struck by the um, the um, almost uh, unbelievable work that you're that you're doing there. Now we're almost out of time, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, the um, the the remaining three speakers just to make a brief comment, maybe just one one or at most two minutes, um, and then I'll ask Chris Lamb to conclude the session. Uh, there's been a, um, a some discussion, I think quite a useful one through the chat. Um, there's one additional comment though that I might ask Chris to comment on in closing, and that is the role of ASEAN here, which was raised by one of the, uh, by one of the, the questioners. Um, so maybe um, Dr. Ye Yint, if um, you could make a, a final comment, perhaps, um, uh, perhaps reflecting on what you've heard from, from the other speakers. Yeah, <clears throat> when I was in the meeting with the Prime Minister Scott Morrison, he still maintained the fact that he want the aid to be delivered to the ASEAN family, so he called it. But um, I, I think that it has uh, done in the past and not to be uh, useful, as we know. So uh, the situation on the ground is very, very vol volatile and very fluid. So I would imagine that uh, uh, with the it needs an incredible work and we will still need to get our communications opened uh, to um, make a grant and to use it quite usefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Tip Tay. Hello, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, you know, uh, everybody coming here and also particularly to Dr. Cynthia Mount and the team joining from Burma. It's so really, uh, you know, I'm really grateful. Thank you. And uh, just want to iterate what, you know, Dr. Mount said. Um, I think coordination, you know, um, among all of us is very important. I mean, coordination from, you know, our Australian colleagues and, and also Myanmar diaspora and also, you know, NGO and, and international NGO and, and mo most importantly, people on the ground you know, ethnic health organization, you know, ethnic arm organization and, and UG and everybody. I think we need to share information. We need to work together and, and aiming that, you know, majority of the donation money, you know, reach to the people who are, you know, in need, you know, as quickly as possible. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Raymond, would you like to make a final uh, comment? Yes, Paul, I'm, I'm the, on, on the chat box, I saw a question posed by Mr. Charlie, uh, who also is working with the people there, on, perhaps on the border, uh, and, and delivering the psychosocial support. His question is uh, in terms of language. There are different ethnic groups, there are different languages and different cultures. So whether we know of any, uh, we, uh, any way to make use of the, uh, the interpreter or the counselor, those sort of things. I think I, I, when I was talking to uh, 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 Dr. Cynthia Mong, uh, she told me that there is a, a doctor uh, working with her uh, doing that psychosocial support. I think we should be working together. And this is an important question. And uh, when we are uh, you know, applying for the grant, uh, we should uh, include that, like uh, ethnic workers and um, interpreter and counselors from different different ethnic group to be involved in it. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. Uh, look, another question that, that was raised that, um, we, that we haven't got around to answering is whether the um, interchange across the border also exists on the Western borders with China or Bangladesh or India. Um, uh, and I wonder, um, I don't know that we can really take that up in detail now, uh, but um, it clearly is another uh, adds another level of complexity, doesn't it, to deal with um, many other countries. So, Chris, um, would you like to take over and close the, um, the the proceedings? Maybe if you know anything about the Western border question, um, that would be useful. But could you also comment on the question about ASEAN, please? Thank you, Paul. There are a couple of questions which I think I, I need to respond to. But before I do that, I'm going to say something which I'll say again later. 
I'm really impressed by the people who came to speak today. I'm very grateful to Raymond and Paul in particular for contacting through your own contacts the people who've come tonight, especially people like Dr. Cynthia with her expertise, but also Zette, uh, Daniel Yeyent, and the others. And I won't mention the anonymous speakers. So thank you so much. You've enriched us a lot and you've made it possible for us to start work on what I hope will be a very compelling and credible request for funding. Now, on this request, uh, Paul mentioned before that we probably wouldn't be able to get this done just yet, but the, the, there's a couple of things that I need to say. I think when the Prime Minister spoke in Perth, he might not have been fully understood, or perhaps it wasn't as clear as it could have been. He spoke, although he didn't say so, about the money that's allocated for the current financial year. There won't be anything available from the current financial year's budget for what we're talking about now. What we're going to be putting together is a proposal for the next financial year, so starting on 1 July. We don't yet know precisely how much money there's going to be in that, but all the indications that I have from the people we have as friends in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade are that the amount of money will be similar to what there is this year. Now, there is a problem. The difficulty is, and the Prime Minister might have alluded to that when he said what he did about ASEAN, the bulk of the Australian uh, aid program for Myanmar goes out through international organisations. A lot of those are intergovernmental organisations, and it's very difficult for that money to be kept away from the grasping hands of the army. So what we will be saying in our submission is that we want a different approach to the way the aid program is delivered. And a lot of what you've said tonight gives us the evidence that we need to show why that's important. And we'll take that up with whoever wins the election on the 21st of May. And we'll point out that we want the aid program to be at least what it is now or more, and that we want it to be able to be uh, drawn up in such a way that the delivery is done through non-government organizations. And I have to mention then another problem. The non-government organizations that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade works with tend to be the big ones with the infrastructure that enables them to meet the financial requirements in terms of accountability and auditing, which are imposed by the Australian Department of Finance. And I'm not suggesting that we should do things that don't meet uh, the Department of Finance's requirements, but I know that Global Reconciliation has had some experience of this, and so do some other organizations. So at the same time, as we work on the preparation of the submission with the ANZ doctors and, and the others, uh, we will be looking at how that can be presented through a route which will be accepted by the Australian government as an auditable and credible route for the delivery of this assistance. There's an issue with uh, the, the way the aid submission is put together. One of the points that was made uh, was that there is a need, probably especially in some of the remote village areas, for that funding to be delivered as cash. Uh, keeping cash out of the hands of the military is a particularly difficult thing to try to work on. But it's, it may be the only way that we can work with some of those communities. So that will be something we will take on board. The ethnic languages, uh, Charlie Artingstall's point, which was already mentioned by Raymond, one of our lead people in AMI is Professor Joseph Lobianco at Melbourne University, who's a particular expert in the way to work across the languages in a country like Myanmar. And there are, of course, a huge number of languages. He has a lot of experience of that. And we have people associated with us at other universities who are experts in Naga languages, the Mon, it doesn't matter which side of the country you're at, we have expertise in those, and we will be looking at how that can be put together also into the submission. And I know that's something which the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade will find an important input for what they're doing. ASEAN. The ASEAN five-point consensus is generally seen by most of the observers to have failed to achieve any kind of uh, recognition or credibility with anybody. If it has a value at the moment, it is that the military haven't accepted either, except to say they have. So nothing's happened. 
with the five-point consensus, except that it remains on the table and remains a great irritant for some of uh, the people in ASEAN who would have probably liked to have been able to make some progress in their own relationships with the military, but they haven't been able to do so because the military have given nice words about the consensus and then done nothing. So we will continue to use the consensus as a base from which we can try to pressure people to deliver what the country needs for its humanitarian purpose. ASEAN's role, apart from that, is very indistinct, but we will work on that too. So uh, back to the beginning. The aid submission will not be based on what the Prime Minister said. It will be based on the future. The people in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade are very keen to hear from us what we have to say, and they hope that we will be able to put together a proposal which meets the needs for accountability and auditing that I mentioned before. What we add to anything else they can get for aid submissions uh, in, in this context is the evidence base. And what we've had from Cynthia and the others tonight and from inside the country and at the border is a very strong contribution to that evidence base. So thank you very much for that. And thank you all for coming. Paul? I'm, so, I'm finished. Do you want to uh, close the curtain? Um, I would just like to um, uh, give my personal thanks to all the speakers um, and particularly the ones from uh, the region, from Thailand and Myanmar itself, um, and to everyone else who has attended. I think the quality of the presentations was extremely high. Um, we've got a lot of work to do now, um, but we've got a lot of material to work with. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And finally, I'd say that the next time we meet will be after the election on Monday, the 30th of May. So what we have to do is some guessing about what kind of a topic to choose for that. And we have some ideas, but if anybody has something in their mind that they think we really should put onto the agenda, send us an email. Thank you.